and this is actually maybe a good tip for like startup founders that are fundraising, I actually write up like a big document with all of the objections I, I anticipate to get. And I write out like lengthy answers to all of them. And I don't share that with anyone. It's for me to make sure I'm like really, really tight and articulate on all of the competitive and like market questions that I, I anticipate to get. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Well, Dylan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So I know I'm really excited to to have you here. You've had a pretty tremendous journey. I mean, you've you've been doing this now since it looks like 2017. Over the last three years, at least from a fundraising perspective, things just kind of blew up. <laughs> you raised, you know, multiple, you know, kind of Series A, Series B, Series C, all fifty million dollar plus rounds. And so curious to see kind of what you did in the early days that they got you there today. Let's start at the beginning. I mean, just walk us through just the context, like in 2017, when you started Assembly AI and, and just what led to the idea in the first place. I knew that I loved startups and working on startups because I'd actually started a company when I was in college and it was like a terrible company, a terrible idea. That's where I learned how I'm going to kind of program because I built uh, like everything for that startup. After we shut the startup down that we were working on in college. I just knew that I loved software development. I loved building things and creating a startup is like the ultimate task of building something because you're just constantly building. So in 2015, 16, I moved out to San Francisco and I took a job as a machine learning engineer at Cisco. I was working on natural language processing and understanding systems. It was around that time that the, that the Amazon Echo came out. And I remember that just felt like such a futuristic experience. I I still remember the commercial. My immediate reaction was like, no way that actually works. You know, these people are just like sitting on their couch and like asking for this song to play and some speakers like hidden somewhere. I, I bought an Echo and I just remember feeling so blown away by how, how well it worked, how futuristic it felt. And I would constantly kind of test it. So I would like be rooms away with like the shower on and the sink on and the TV on and see if I could still get the Alexa to play this song or answer my question. And it worked and it was just so crazy and so cool. What a good experience felt like because prior to that, I mean, still today, which is crazy, you talk into your phone sometimes. It's terrible. Yeah. I don't <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. I got really into this whole idea of natural language interfaces, especially over voice. And then I also totally saw where machine learning was headed. You saw this kind of gen AI, I mean, maybe you didn't, let's say predict it, but you, you, you already felt like things were kind of going to go there. Totally. Uh, because classical machine learning, you really had to build these task specific models, do this handcrafted feature engineering for vision, for speech, for natural language were performing pretty well. And they were very much the V zero. And you just saw, okay, if the ceiling's nowhere in sight and these models are going to get bigger. They're going to train on more data. Compute is getting better. So was that generally accepted? Because that, that's still pretty early. I mean, obviously AI has been a buzzword for, for a while and it's gone through, you know, its own hype cycle. I'm just trying to remember back to like 2015, 2016, deep learning obviously, you know, was a thing, but would you say it was generally accepted back then that that was going to be like the thing or was that a bit of a, an insight on your part? It was definitely, I don't know if mainstream is the white word, is the right word. Because, for example, I, I, I remember going to the first TensorFlow meetup down at Google's headquarters in Mountain View, wherever Google's headquarters are. And that was in 2016, 2015. There was already this ecosystem around TensorFlow, which was the deep learning library of, of choice at the time. So it kind of had some believers, but wasn't necessarily like, you know, a mainstream thing yet. But you were one of those, let's say, early believers. The models, they were, they had a ton of potential and it it was, it was still so early, but the actual accuracy of these models was still not that good, right? So even like speech to text models that were deep learning based in 2016, 2017, the error rate of those models compared to the error rate now, I mean, it is dramatically improved. The first model I ever trained for speech to text was on 10,000 hours of audio data. And then now the model that we're going to release soon, that's trained on 12 and a half million hours of audio data. It's on you know, hundreds of TPUs. So just the scale has increased so much 
And as a result, the accuracy and the capability and the robustness of the models that you can create now has improved so much. And so now it is mainstream. Everyone's working on it. Every company is trying to implement AI or think about AI as, as, as part of their strategy. But back then, it was only the early adopters that were actually putting this stuff into production. And did you like back then, like, was it always your idea to kind of be this layer that others would build on top of? Or did you think through, because let's say, you know, arguably, if you have the best speech to text, maybe you need to, you know, you just build an app to do transcription and you offer transcription. Did you think through that? As a developer, I was always so inspired by the iconic developer companies like Twilio, like Stripe. There was a company at the time in 2015, 16, like when, when all this was kind of formulating called wit.ai. I don't know if you've heard of them. They were acquired by Facebook. They're a small company, but they built this developer platform for building these text-based natural language interfaces. So you could train it to understand like, hey, I, I want to set an alarm. AI would take that prompt and would turn it into this structured JSON that your app could, could operate on. So if someone said, hey, I want to set my alarm for 7 p.m., they would spit out a JSON that was like action. Right. So it text to code. Yeah. Exactly. And the community around it was 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 so cool and people were building so many cool things with it. And I say that because for me, building a developer platform was always something as a developer I was really passionate about. And so the goal really when we started the company was let's build really advanced new models for speech tasks, speech to text, speaker diarization speech understanding, and let's make them available through a developer platform that is super easy to use that has great docs that you can get started on for free and that can scale with you if you deploy it at really large scale, even if you're a big enterprise organization. But let's build that platform that anyone can just pick up and use, whether you're a college student or a developer at a Fortune 500. Democratizing really powerful and cool tech, whether it's the ability to process a credit card or send a text message or do something with an AI model. As a developer, I feel like unleashes the potential of this tech to so many people. And there's entire businesses that have been built on Twilio as a result. But it just shows when you make this technology just really accessible and easy, people will unleash their creativity. And I want it to, to, to work in that space. And so at this time, I mean, you're in California, you're working at Cisco, the brand name company, you're a machine learning uh, developer, you're, I'm assuming, making, you know, pretty good salary. Like, when do you decide to take that leap of faith? Like, how far along do you get on assembly AI before you kind of quit that full-time job and, and just go all in? I, I, it's funny because I, I worked on a startup in college and then I just did software development as a contractor for like two years. And then I took this job at Cisco and then I started assembly. And I feel like the time at Cisco is almost this like paid vacation, <laughs> sort of speaking. It was, <laughs> it was like like active rest. You know, maybe, no, that's not the word. It was like active rest mode. You know, when you're working out, you don't want to sprint, but it, yeah, yeah, you, you do stuff. Not too much struggling, like just enough that it gives you a little bit of. I went to the gym every day at like five p.m. I was in amazing shape. I was reading. I was like learning things <laughs> in my spare time. I I just felt bored because nothing I was working on just felt like it had impact. Um, you know, and I I wanted to feel like what I was doing was having impact and was that your mindset like through it like through that time at cisco you were kind of like this is my like in between like i'm gonna find a startup i'm gonna find a problem i really care about and work on it was that like said in your mind that you'd be if you found something again or it just not really. it just kind of happened i mean i think it's always hard to predict out like what your personal future will will look like i knew i wanted to go to san francisco i knew i wanted to get closer to the startup ecosystem. I knew that I would eventually want to start another company. Where is assembly AI when you take that? Like quitting is, I mean, it's a big decision. Like going in, actually you gave me your two weeks. There was nothing. So I, it was just me. And I was like, okay, I, I just want to work on this. And so I quit. I didn't want to work on it while I was at Cisco. And so I quit and I started working on it. Forget this specific time, but it was near the YC summer batch application deadline. I wanted to try to get my thoughts out for like what I was working on. And so I submitted an application to YC for their summer batch. This is like summer of 2017. And it was 30 days past the deadline. So I was like single founder past the deadline. There's no way I'm going to get in. You know, I was planning to just work on it, recruit a co-founder, uh, apply to YC later once there was more traction and we had like more built and I had a team. But long story short, ended up getting into YC, was uh, in Europe, 
at the time I found out- What do they see? What did YC see back then? So our group partner is this really brilliant guy. His name's Daniel Gross. He does a ton of AI investing. And he had worked at Apple and just saw that this was uh, there was an opportunity here because he had interfaced with with companies building this type of tech. He saw that it wasn't that good. He saw that there was no real easy way for developers or companies to get access to this tech at the time. And so he was a believer and he was on the interview panel and then he became my group partner and he's now a major investor in the company too. So he really believed in the idea in large part, I think is probably why we we got accepted to YC. So it was it was the fact that he had I think firsthand experience to see that this was possible because a lot of people at the time were like, "Oh, are the big tech companies just gonna make this stuff and it's gonna be the best?" What was your answer to that? Because yeah, that's that's the obvious maybe like first level question is like, "Oh, a speech to text API, like you know Google do this or whatever." I believed at the time and still believe that to create the best product is not just a function of resources. You know, you don't just like put a budget and people in a bottle and shake and then out comes this like amazing product. You can definitely increase the likelihood of that, the more resources and people you have to a point, because at a certain point, more resources and people actually becomes like a hindrance. There's that software development book, like the mythical man man month. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's like the more people you add on a project, sometimes the slower it actually goes. That's right. So I always felt like there was an opportunity here, you know, going like head to head with a Google on like their a core area of their product, like search, like that's a much harder task for something that they're not focused on and they weren't at the time. A YC partner actually I saw recently wrote something about this on like Twitter or LinkedIn, which was like, you're really not competing with Google, you're competing with like a PM at Google. Then it's like trying to have a successful product under their belt and that's navigating all these internal politics. And of course if it becomes like the main focus of a of a company again like search or now with, you know, Gemini trying to compete with GPT, it's a different story. But at the time and still now where we're focusing on creating our product is not within the core focus area of these larger companies. So the opportunity space is around working much cl- more closely with developers and with customers in this emerging market to understand like what they need and to build the best product for them. And so let's go back to that. You, you get into YC, which, you know, oftentimes is like a huge moment, like inflection point, right or wrong, I think, for startups. Is that what happened to you? Like, did you find like there's a before and after YC and things that just kind of took off? <laughs> it definitely became more real when we got into YC. And I remember going down to YC for the first day and I was like, I don't know if I can curse on the show, but I was like, oh shit, like this is, this is, this is real now because I had started the company like a month prior and then in YC and YC is basically like a sprint to demo day. And it's really just 90 days right? It's three months. So like you need to have progress made. And I had nothing when I started. When I was building, you can't just like quickly pull together like a web app. Like you have to train these models, you have to get data, it takes a while. And I remember at the time, each model iteration took like a week to train or something, two weeks to train. And so if you think about that, if you're just consecutively training models, you know, you have like six model runs essentially, because there's like two a month and there's YC's three months. So startups are all about iteration, especially in the early stage. And still now my ability to iterate was pretty slow back then because I was bounded by the speed at which I could train models and iterate on the models to get them to be good enough so that people would start using them. So we didn't make a ton of progress in terms of like go-to-market traction during YC, but we did make progress and we got just got started able to raise a seed round after YC, which gave us the runway to hire some people. I mean, first of all, you keep saying we, but I remember it was just you. So did you recruit like some early people through that YC yeah. stage? Yeah. So I, I hired some people through that early stage. I mean, when I got into YC, it was like, okay, you have 90 days. I can either use those 90 days to like, or a significant portion of those 90 days to recruit a co-founder, or I can try to just get really far myself and then raise capital at the end of YC and then hire people <laughs> as essentially like late co-founders. And that's what I chose to do because I felt like that was the better use of time. The first month, two months was really just me and then leveraged a mix of like people in my network that I hired as like contractors or uh, within the, the the first couple months of YC just to get stuff going. And then after demo day, when we raised, I think we raised like a... Um, like a million dollars. Was that hard? Like, what was that? What was that raise like? I mean, because you have you have no no 
real customer traction. I assume the model still doesn't really work like all that well. I mean, it's really just a bet on you and deep learning, you know, in a high level thesis. Yeah. So no institutional funds invested. It was only angels that invested because a lot of the angels that invested, they saw that either through their own personal experience or like their own career, other investments, that there's totally an opportunity for startups to to build great developer products in spaces where there's large incumbents. And you've seen this like Stripe, PayPal uh, is, is a great example. And there's a lot of others like Heroku. So we had a lot of angel investors that invested in the first the first round we did after YC that saw that there was an opportunity for us to create this company. And what was the what was the VC path like? Like I assume you, you spoke to them. What, what was their reaction? Why did they pass? It was just like the how will you compete with Google question. So that that was pretty much it. And I was like, okay, I I, I know the questions they're going to ask. So so now actually every time I fundraise and and this is actually maybe a good tip for like startup founders that are fundraising, I actually write up like a big document with all of the objections I, I anticipate to get. And I write out like lengthy answers to all of them. And I don't share that with anyone. It's for me to make sure I'm like really, really tight and articulate on all of the competitive and like market questions that I, I anticipate to get. That has been super helpful now. I had never raised money before, right? Like never raised money for a startup. And the very first meeting I took at the end of YC was with Sequoia. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like no experience fundraising, you know, no real progress, like don't really know what I'm doing. And just start with like the the most experienced investors uh, possible. Probably like not the right strategy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you went to the all-star game kind of right, <laughs> right yeah, on the bench. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so in hindsight probably stupid. I didn't have a, a name, right? So it'd be different if I was this like PhD or this very seasoned entrepreneur and I like could show that I had a resume. I knew what I was doing, but I was unknown. We didn't really have a lot of traction. And the, even now still, you're biased to think it will be hard for assembly to compete, but there are thankfully really brave and ambitious angel investors out there. <laughs> That's right. That's why I call it angels for a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And still investors like our investors now, I mean, Steve and Sarah at Excel and Rebecca at Insight, and then the 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 more recent investors from Smith Point, like Keith Block, they all believe too. So I think when you're raising capital, the biggest thing is just finding people that believe in the opportunity and that are excited about it. It's a, a bit of a numbers game. So you have to just meet as many people as possible to find that. It's kind of like dating, right? I mean, you're not going to like find your soulmate on your first date. Well, I think that's totally true. And especially for the early rounds, like in later rounds, you have numbers, you have traction, like you start fitting in, in specific boxes. There's still a numbers game element to it. I think in the early days, you're totally right. I mean, it's really about just finding believers. I mean, if somebody doesn't get deep learning, doesn't care about, you know, building platforms, it doesn't really matter how great your story is. They're probably not going to be, you know, the right fit for you. And so that that's really what you're looking for. Um, okay. So, so kind of moving along, I mean, you, you raise that round, you have like, I mean, even a million dollars. It's not a lot of money. I guess you hire a few, you know, handful of people. What are you like five people or so at that point? We're like three people for a long time. And I think in hindsight, still today, it's difficult building a research-based product because, I mean, you're never done in software development, but there's a spectrum to the quality of everything you build, right? Like there's, there's accuracy metrics and there's issues even with our current models that are really good and industry leading. So it's very hard to know like what is the threshold that you have to pass on certain metrics for the product that you're building. Back then, what what was the where you like we need to be ninety five percent accurate or like what was even the goal? You're three people, you have a bit of money, a bit of runway. What are you shooting for? Because even if you take a look at GPT three point five and GPT three existed for a long time prior to Chat GPT. It was the RLHF and the dialogue component of ChatGPT that triggered the, the takeoff. And that was the, the capability threshold. Like it was at that time that this capability threshold passed where now it is a pri like LLMs are priority for every organization. Well, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's like this good enough or not good enough, right? It's kind of binary in a sense. Like at some point you just, you don't, you don't work in, in the eyes of people. And then there's some point where you pass it. Well, obviously you still can get better, but you go from not working to working. <laughs> You know, at least that's kind of what it feels like from the outside. Exactly. And and I would I would argue like GB2 3. or GBT3, or I forget the specific version numbers, but like it worked pretty well prior to chat GPT. I think my point with this is like in the early days, I think we could have actually gone a lot faster 
if we had said, okay, let's do nothing but pick accuracy metrics that we feel like we want to uh, surpass. And once we surpass those metrics, then let's go and take this thing to market. But the thing is, it, didn't you just not know at what point the market would accept? You didn't know back then, but I also think that we were trying to make short-term progress because we were in YC. And it was hard to break out of that mindset post YC. You have these weekly meetings in YC with your partners and it's like, okay, what progress is, have you made? What progress have you made? Well, the mantra is like quick iteration, right? It's like lean startup methodology. I think there's like some, you know, you should be growing 10% week over week in y during YC. Because if you're building a consumer or even B2B like app and you can quickly acquire users and iterate over the weekend or at night, ship new features and iterate super quickly, you have a higher chance of finding that traction quickly within a compressed time frame. if you're working super hard like you do in YC. But for us, because we were building models, it was like, all right, let's train this model. Let's see if we can get people to use it. They can't. So let's trade another one. Let's see if we can get people to use it. Because we were trying to make progress really quickly because we didn't have a ton of capital. Back in YC, when we did it, you received 125K investment. And I knew that we would need to raise more funding at the end of YC. So we had to try to show some progress, some traction. And we had a little bit, you know, to 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 be honest, which which helped the round. It wasn't like we had nothing. But I think it was hard to break out of that mindset post YC. So over the first year, we were still kind of all right, let's iterate, try to get customers, iterate, try to get customers. Whereas if we took a longer term approach earlier on and said, for the next year, we know there's market demand, right? It's not like we're building a productivity tool where we don't know, like, is there going to be product market fit for this, this mode of note taking that like we are pioneering? We know there's market demand for this tech. There are industry established accuracy metrics that we can leverage. Let's let's like set goals for these metrics and let's surpass them. And then let's, you know, go to market after. And we could have been much more explicit about that. And so I think learning lesson for me, if I were to start another company again, is like really when starting as much as possible, try to set really, really clear long-term goals and then work towards them and be very disciplined. You might have a customer that will want to use your early kind of MVP, but if that customer pulls you in the wrong direction, they're going to have a ton of influence because they're your first customer. And then you have to build for them. And for those early days, I think we could have gone faster if we were more focused and disciplined. I think that makes sense. I think in your case, I mean, the way I, I abstract it out is like in the early days, you're trying to de-risk and you're trying to find like, what's the biggest source of risk for this to work to get to the next step? And let's de-risk that. And I think in most cases, that risk is really demand. It's like you're doing something new. You don't even know if people are going to buy it. So that's why you get into this kind of iterative kind of customers. Hey, is this good enough? Whatever. In your case, I, I think you're right. Like demand wasn't the biggest risk. The biggest risk was just, can you actually with this deep learning uh, infrastructure, get the, the technology to a place where it's better than everything else or, or whatever. And so it would have made sense. If you're building a productivity tool and you don't show customers and you build for a year, they might be like, I don't care. <laughs> this thing's stupid. Correct. And there's no risk on building. Like you will definitely be able to build the tool. It's more just, will they buy? So maybe walk me through this. Like you got a million dollars, you got whatever, three-ish people. You're doing this this cycle. You said like for over a year. I mean, cash is, is running out. I don't think you can get profitable. Like what's going through your mind in terms of where you need to get to to, to, ne to raise that next round of funding? So we started to get our first customers in, I think like late, 2019. It was kind of the first two years were kind of just building. And honestly, our models were pretty good at the time from an industry perspective, but the industry, even best in class back then was just not that good. You, you couldn't power that many use cases back then because the models were not very robust. They were not very good. So for the first two years, we we're really just building kind of like wandering in the forests. And then it was around 2019 that we started to get our first couple of customers. I think that was the time that we kind of passed this like initial threshold of like, okay, it's good enough now to power certain use cases and applications and customers started switching to it from whatever they were trying to do before, or they were able to now build something that they had been wanting to for a long time, but it just wasn't good enough anywhere yet. And then that's continued to happen, right? Like as we've made models that have gotten better, as other tech within the ecosystem has gotten better, like vector databases and text-to-speech models and large language models, Priest, the, the amount of things you can do now with this tech is is increasing and it's increasing every day. And so we, we, we always are seeing 
more and more and newer and newer projects and products and features being built because the tech continues to get better. The ecosystem continues to get more mature. Adoption continues to mature. And it's uh, still super early from an adoption perspective. When you look at the market, like enterprises are still really figuring out what they're doing with AI, what the use cases are, but it's maturing rapidly. Do you remember some of the first use cases that like some of those first customers, what their use cases were, or maybe even one of the first things you remember where you were like, wow, we're powering this application. Like This was like, we've been building towards. Yeah. So one of our first customers was building this product where they were analyzing TV and radio stations 24 seven. And then they were looking for certain brand mentions that were spoken and alerting those brands when their names were mentioned. That was one of the first customers we had. And they actually found out about us on Hacker News. The CTO reached out and they checked out our API and they liked it and they they built this product with it. So, and then there were a few others. Some of the initial customers were um, like in the call center space. So analyzing customer support calls to create insights. There were some voice agent, like voice bot applications in the early days too. And you're seeing a lot more of those now, but primarily in the early days, it was like media contact center type use cases. Based on Crunchbase, what I see is you raise this kind of YC thing, you raise this million dollar round. And then the next thing that's listed, at least there is 2020, you raise like $50 million. <laughs> what what happened between like, was there a smaller, you know, like a C plus or a series A or something that, that bridged that gap? Yeah. So we raised a million dollars after YC in 2017. And then I think it was like right after COVID. No, it was the summer of 2020. We raised a $5 million round. And that was also from Angels. It was um, Daniel Gro, like Daniel Gro, Snap Freeman. And were you like, what was traction like at that point? We had passed like a million dollars in ARR. Like we had, we had like decent traction at that time. We were growing pretty quickly and we we're still a super small team. I think we we're like sub 10 people. And then it was a year and a half later that we raised the A and then a couple months later, our B and then um, most recently our C. So the 2020 is really when things started to to compound and the trajectory really changed. And what do you attribute that to? Was that just like basically this tech getting good enough, like getting over that bar where, where all of a sudden people could just build all these applications on top of? Yeah, it was a combination. It was macro, market adoption, mature in part because the tech was getting better, right? So like as the tech gets better and early adopters demonstrate its capability out in market, that pulls the market forward and then more people adopt. So that's just like been happening. And then of course, 2022, this whole- Gen AI wave. uh, All this innovation has just taken that market adoption and accelerated it more than I think anyone could have imagined even 18 months, two years ago. Uh, It's hard to- remember beginning of 2023, like there's one mainstream LM <laughs> and and now there's like th- thousands and there's open source models and there's tons of companies in the space. So this acceleration we're, we're, we're in the middle of is, is very new, but I think it will continue to be honest. Perfect. Well, let, let's stop it there. Let me just end with the two questions that we always end on. Uh, maybe, so the first question is, when did you first feel like you had true product market fit? It's interesting, right? Because for us, I knew that there was market demand even before we started building the thing. Whereas with a lot of companies, you don't know like, hey, are people going to want this service or is there going to be product market fit for this type of product or service? But for us, similar to self-driving cars, like you know that level five self-driving cars will have product market fit, even though they don't exist yet. Now, of course, if they cost a million dollars per vehicle, the addressable market's probably much smaller versus if they cost like $10,000 or if there was just robo-taxis everywhere. So there is a question of economics, but there's not a question of market demand, like unit economics, but not market demand. For us, I always had conviction that there was market demand and product market fit for what we were building. That being said, I think that you know we serve many different use cases. So we have people building so many different types of things with our API. There's still opportunity for us to improve product market fit for what people are predominantly choosing to build. And that's really the work right now. So I would say it never it never stops because the market's changing. What customers want to do and users want to do is always evolving. But I always had conviction that there was product market fit for what we were building. Final question. If you could go back to when you were just starting Assembly AI back in 2016, 2017 with one piece of advice for yourself, what what would that be? I would have advised my myself to take a longer term view in the first year, 
especially coming out of YC, like slow down. Now that you're done YC, what do you want to accomplish over the next two years? Like, where do you want to be in two years? And then just work towards that. You know, I think like I was mentioning earlier, coming out of YC, you're kind of trained within those 90 days to just be like, the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking. You're always thinking that when you're running a startup, because like there are macro factors, right? Like you don't, other people are competing in the same space. You can't just operate on your own timeline, but I would have given myself, urged myself to have, take more permission to think longer term about what I want to have accomplished within a year or two years. And then break that back down into like quarterly goals and and use that as a foundation of of hiring and prioritization uh, versus trying to just make quick progress as 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 quickly as possible. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Dylan. I mean, you're now uh, one of the leading companies is what is probably the, the hottest sector. And uh, so really appreciate you taking us through the early days and, and what it took for you to build uh, what's now what's now having so much success. So appreciate you jumping on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I just gave you content that you liked so much, you actually listened to the end. And guess what? You didn't pay a single dollar. Not only that, I didn't even put any ads in your face. So you just got a bunch of content for free. And now that I've delivered that value, I'm asking for something in return. Open your app, open Apple Podcasts, open Spotify, open whatever app you use to listen to this and hit that follow button. It's actually going to help you because it's going to help you make sure you don't miss out on the next episode, which you like so much that you listen to the whole thing.